What's cracking guys, Omar Esau here, back with another video. In this video today, I got a special guest. I got my boy Eric Helms, gonna lay the beat down when it comes to peri-workout nutrition. Peri means around, around the workout, how should you consume your nutrition? Should you consume protein? Is it necessary? I've talked about this topic before, but very shortly, I didn't explain the mechanisms, the science behind it. Today, Eric is going to go in depth about this. So, is it necessary? Because the supplement industry will have you believe that it is very important that you perfectly time certain nutrients, you know, before, during, and after your workout to optimize the amount of muscle you should build. But is this true? I'm going to let Eric handle this. I just want to say quickly, too, guys, I got a very cool announcement that will be in tomorrow's video. Check back tomorrow. I'm currently editing my five. 500,000 subscriber challenge. I did a lifting challenge. Damn near killed me. You will see what's going on. It's just taking me a while to edit. In the meantime, enjoy this excellent video. Shout out to Eric Helms for doing this video. If you like this style of informative content, make sure to like this video and post below what you want to see Eric talk about next. Hello everyone. I'm back. Eric Helms from 3D Muscle Journey. You can check us out at 3dmusclejourney.com and I'm here on Omar Isif's channel, thanks again my brosif, to talk about applications of, uh, of science in bodybuilding and powerlifting and just getting more fit in general. And uh, as always, we're going to be discussing things so that you understand them in a more complete manner, so that you understand not just what to do and memorize rules, but more so that you understand the underlying foundation and the actual why behind the what of what you're doing so that you can make better decisions in your own training and hopefully get to better heights and more massive gains with a Z. So today we're going to be talking about peri-workout nutrition. Uh, the, the carbs and the proteins around training and when, the why, the how. And I think there's been a lot of misinformation over the years and additionally there's been a lot of changing science. Um, and, and now I think we're at a point where there's different camps and there's people who've memorized things but people don't quite understand the why, the how, and what actually differentiates between different scenarios where you may want to consider different approaches to peri-workout nutrition. So, first let's talk about bro science. And no, I'm not going to tell you what is bro science in this instance. I want us to remember something. That many of the things that we call quote unquote bro science today were considered scientific fact not too long ago. So I think this is one of those terms that is often misused, where we think something is just, oh, invented by the bros. But in reality, it may just be that the scientific leading authorities 20 years ago might have been giving incomplete messages or incorrect messages because they didn't have the data we have today, uh, and then those have been repeated now. That's not bro science. That's just science, because science is ever-evolving. Now, if something was completely based on anecdote and just passed around in, in gym lockers and, and uh, promoted by, you know, buff guys as the best way to do it because that's what they did and the guy before them did it, maybe you could call that bro science, but we need to be careful with this term. In the specific instance of peri-workout nutrition, uh, much of the recommendations that have kind of been turned in their heads in recent years were based on decades of peri-workout nutrition-based studies. So let's talk about the original studies that were done and uh, why they indicated that it's very important and why they would emphasize having protein and even carbohydrate around your workout. So first we got to talk about uh, how, how science is done. Uh, there are two types of studies, well, actually more than two types of studies, but there's two types of studies I want to talk about. There are what's called mechanistic or basic research where you're looking at the mechanism, how something happens typically in a petri dish or maybe in an animal because you're doing a study you can't do in a human, or maybe you're doing it in a human but it's under very uh, abnormal or, or rather uh, not normal conditions you'd see in the gym, but very specific laboratory conditions and the studies are very short, lasting maybe one hour, eight hour, 12 hours, 48 hours. Uh, and then there are also applied studies where we are tracking and measuring variables and making changes to nutrition or training, but looking at outcomes over multiple weeks or months or even longer sometimes, and the conditions of the study are meant to replicate what happens in practice. A lot of the research that was originally done in peri-workout nutrition was what I would describe as mechanistic. Often what they would do is they would have these 8 to 16 hour studies 
and they would give, uh, they would feed um, protein immediately after a, a training stimulus. So they might have you come to the lab after a eight hour fast, so you weren't allowed to eat anything, so normally you come in in the morning, no breakfast, um, eight hour sleeping period, so you, you have a good baseline measure, and then you'd come in and you would do, let's say, uh, leg extensions to failure. And then there'd be three different groups, one group that had uh, water post-workout, one group that had carbohydrates, uh, one group that had 10 grams of whey, and then one group that had 20 grams of whey, and then one group that had 40 grams of whey. And then they would immediately measure what's called muscle protein synthesis in the hours following that period uh, for the length up to, say, six to eight hours later or something like that. Uh, they would be looking at uh, how how much muscle was being synthesized, or how much protein was being synthesized in the machinery of actual muscle protein synthesis changes, uh, specifically with, with uh, you know, measuring blood markers in your body during that time period. And this is a very specific measurement. It, it involves tr tracking uh, radioactive tracers in the body and seeing uh, where they're deposited, and basically the kinetics or the movement in the body of certain um, proteins and, and or, or rather amino acids to see if uh, synthesis of, of new proteins in the muscle was elevated and to what degree and for how long. Okay, Very, very scientific, very hard to do science, takes a lot of skill, very interesting, uh, very nerdy, but not necessarily telling you are you growing over time. Okay, So based on all these studies in a fasted state, uh, it was found that having a certain dosage post-workout or pre-workout or even both sometimes augmented muscle protein synthesis. Uh, then they went on to do some studies that actually were applied where uh, you would you know, take two groups, have one group have protein post-workout, another group not, and they would find that, oh my god, the group that did protein post-workout, they would grow better. So therefore, we should be having protein around training. Now there's a couple confounding variables here. One is now from data we have today, we know that the initial muscle protein synthesis response within that first day or so are largely confounded by the effect of damage, muscle damage, especially in untrained populations or populations doing an unfamiliar movement, they're untrained on that movement, um, or basically a novel stimulus. We know that initial increases in muscle protein synthesis are more related to regenerating that damage and aren't predictive of long-term growth. We've actually seen that in a couple different studies now. We've seen a study by Mitchell et al. where muscle protein protein synthesis acutely did not track uh, with, uh, with muscle growth over time. And then a more recent study uh, where the, the muscle protein synthesis after 24 hours did correlate to muscle growth. So we knew that that was the confounding variable. Okay, So that is a big confounding variable in those acute studies looking at muscle protein synthesis. In the studies where they actually looked at, oh, this group got bigger, this one didn't, these applied studies there's two things happening. Not only are you asking someone to have protein post-workout, you're also asking them to have more total protein. If Johnny has 100 grams of protein, and then Timmy has 100 grams of protein plus 20 grams of protein post-workout, it's not just the timing difference, it's also 120 versus 100. And that was the big question that started to get, tried to be answered more recently uh, by folks like Alan Aragon, Brad Schoenfeld, and James Krieger. They published a few uh, pieces of, uh, of work um, uh, a narrative review and then also a systematic review where they said, hold on, could this be just be not an effect of timing but rather an effect of total protein intake? Okay, so um, they looked and found that for the most part when you started looking and correcting for total protein intake that the effect really started to go away and so maybe this isn't an effect of timing but rather just the fact that one group is having more total protein. And as you can see here, this is a graph from a meta-analysis, or rather a figure, and you can see that the error bar crosses the zero. So in statistics, that just means that overall there was not a statistically significant effect. However, you'll notice that almost all the studies, uh, their findings are on the right side of this, showing that it's favoring having protein uh, post-workout, uh, although the effect is pretty minor. And if you use different statistical techniques, you might be able to say, you know, there was actually some chance that you're getting a small benefit. Uh, and that's why if you look back at the narrative review that was written by uh, Aragon and colleagues, uh, you'll find that they still recommend about 0.4 to 0.5 grams per kilogram of protein within one to two hours on either side of the workout just to make sure you're clinching any potential benefit. That's a pretty broad range. Now, 
that's a protein. So it doesn't seem to have a huge benefit when you have total enough in the day, but why? Well, when you think about it, the studies that show that benefit of protein post-workout in a fasted state, well, that's not the way we typically operate. Oftentimes, we're eating before we train, or uh, we've only had a meal two, three hours ago, and we're not taking in whey protein isolate and nothing else, like is very common in these studies. We're having mixed meals, so digestion times is very long, and we're having multiple meals and mixed meals, sorry, mixed meals multiple times over the day with varying digestion, digestive speeds. So what that results in is that we have amino acids in our system almost all the time. So sure, if you're in a fasted state, it might be prudent to get in immediate uh, quick proteins like whey so that you can start to reverse that catabolic process because training is inherently actually catabolic. However, uh, in the real world, you're often in a fed state most of the time. Uh, so that becomes much less of an issue. So the timing becomes less important because there's almost always amino acids there that are ready to be used for repair and rebuild. So uh, with that said, it still does seem there might be some small benefit of just making sure there's an abundance of high quality protein around training to support that process. So the recommendation stands uh, that we probably want roughly 0.2 grams per pound on either side uh, of your workout within a one to two hour period. Um, and that basically just ensures that, that you're t you've crossed all your, your T's, dotted all your I's, and you've, you've made sure you've gotten all the gains you can. Um, so uh, it just means that it's not as critically important as it used to be concluded in the day, back in the day with the old science we had that was a little confounded and a little incomplete. Uh, the other question we have is, you know, what about carbohydrate? Uh, doesn't the insulin response to carbohydrate uh, suppress muscle protein breakdown and contribute to the overall anabolic effect of peri-workout nutrition? Well, a couple things here. Uh, one, the original recommendation for having carbohydrates around training was to replenish glycogen. However, even in a moderate carb diet, uh, glycogen gets replenished in a 24-hour in, in period. And it's pretty rare and probably not recommended to have a training program where you're training the same muscle group within the same day twice. Like you have biceps in the morning and biceps at night. Uh, there wouldn't be really any reason to do that. Okay, uh, So replenishing muscle glycogen, probably not an issue, probably not a limiting factor for a bodybuilder. You could maybe make an argument uh, that in a, in a calorie deficit or a carb-restricted diet with a high training frequency per body part that it might be a good idea to have carbohydrates around your training, uh, but that's a pretty rare circumstance. Uh, and we need, we need data before we can confirm that for sure. And then finally, we know that whole insulin thing. Uh, the insulin being anti-catabolic, we know uh, that protein also stimulates insulin secretion, not just carbohydrate. So in essence, and it reaches the level that maxes out any kind of uh, benefit to, to overall muscle protein balance uh, when you take in an adequate amount of protein. So if your goal is strictly hypertrophy, um, the, the idea of taking in carbohydrate around training as a, a way to modulate the growth response via insulin probably doesn't make sense because it's already taken care of uh, with protein. So those are the two main arguments for why you'd want a carbohydrate around training. And I will say there's still maybe some, some, some rationale for being on a high body part frequency in a calorie or carbohydrate restricted uh, situation to having carbohydrate around your training. Um, or if you're maybe training, say, legs in the morning and doing a cardio session that involves your legs at night, you probably want some carbohydrate post-training. But for the purposes of just augmenting the growth signal around the workout, probably doesn't make a lot of sense because protein's already doing that for you. So folks, hopefully you understand the history of the research, the whys and the hows, and that helps you get to the point where you understand not just memorizing a number, but why you're doing it in the first place. All right, folks, I'll talk to you next time. This is Eric Helm signing out. Thanks again, Omar. I'll talk to you soon.